Hello, and welcome to the Influence Change at Work show. I'm your host, Heather Stagel, founder and change facilitator at Enclaria, where you can accelerate your influence and overcome obstacles to change so you can make a bigger impact in your workplace. Today, my guest is Christy West, who joins the show to share how to create a climate for change through improvisation. Christy is a certified applied improv practitioner, speaker, and founder of Brave Space. She has been performing, studying, and teaching improv for almost two decades. Along with her improv experience, Christy spent over 15 years in B2B sales and corporate training. Today, Christy's work at Brave Space is taking improv off the stage and into corporate environments to help foster innovation, creativity, collaboration, new mindsets, and a whole slew of critical communication skills needed in today's ever-evolving, tech-driven, chaotic work environment. Christy, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you so much, Heather. This is uh, a great opportunity to talk about the work. Great. So let's just start with the basics. Like, what are we even talking about when we talk about improv? Improvisation. Good question. Uh, So, I mean, improv is improv, right? People kind of overthink it. That's one thing I've learned over the past couple of decades is um, we tend to overthink it. And it's, it's really just... Uh, what we do every day. When we step out of the house to go to work or to the grocery store, no one's carrying a script. So we're really improvising all the time. I think uh, where people miss uh, sort of the bigger meaning around improv is that it is a muscle. It is a skill. It's not like this ambiguous thing, like, you know, people connect it to comedy or theater, which it can be but it is really just a skill after all. You know, how well do you improvise? How well do you roll with those moments in life that are unscripted? And that's really at the very base level. Uh, I always just tell people, don't overcomplicate it. Don't overthink it. <laughs> yeah, because when I think of improv, I do think of like Second City in Chicago. I used to live there and we'd go there sometimes and just see a show yeah. and have people you know, acting out things just on the cuff or off the cuff, I guess. And uh, so that's my experience thinking of improv. That's what I think of. So what's the history there? Like, how did you decide that you wanted to take this from the history of it to what you're doing today? Yeah, I, you know, honestly, I'm, you know, super honest when I talk to people about my background, because I didn't even discover or know what improv was until I was mid-20s. I had already and, you know, through college and and starting a career. And because I grew up in a really small town with not a lot of cultural opportunities, if you would, we didn't even have drama at my high school. So I didn't even know what improv was. I mean, besides the basic meaning of just making things up, but as an art form until I, you know, was in my mid-20s and and discovered it upon looking uh, for a hobby here to just kind of exercise my creative side. I'm very creative, very imaginative. I love comedy. I love performing. And so for me, this was uh, something that I've been doing as a child and all through my life. I just didn't know there was a thing. There was a a name for it. (laughs) Right. So personally, that's how I discovered it. And of course, that's when I started to delve into what is this? Oh my gosh, this has been around for 30, 40 years. I mean, really, You know, if you look at Wikipedia and improv and you look at the history of improv, it's going to tell you this started back in, you know, something BC, you know, the cavemen, which is true. Like, you know, the the Commedia dell'arte in Italy and all this, it's, you know, performing on the streets uh, with nothing but just an idea. So we can get very probably in the weeds if we really start talking about the, the, the history of improv. But as we know it, as modern improv started in like the 40s and the 50s in Chicago. Um, but before Second City, the Compass Players, which was a, a group derived by Paul Sills, who's the son of Viola Spolin, who is kind of what we call maybe the grandmother of improv, who actually kind of brought improvisation into theaters by way of teaching children, um, you know, immigrant children in Chicago um, as an integration tool. And so I think it's neat that improv really started as just games for children. And that kind of got, you know, caught the eye of Paul Sills, who then said, you know what, this is, this is great for theater. It's a great tool for creativity, a great tool for actors. And so 
Compass Players started, Compass Players turned into Second City. So there's a lot of, you know, controversy around it. Did they really start it? I just get caught up in it. I just know personally for me, when I found improv, I really kind of resonated with the idea of this starting out as children's games and, and the idea of helping immigrant children integrate um, because that's really at the heart of what it does. It really uh, is a bonding and, and human experience. And um, I think if I get one comment more than anything else, no matter what I'm doing, whether it's a theater workshop for actors or a corporate workshop for business people at the end, people always say to me, I had no idea that this was such a bonding experience, meaning I feel more integrated and connected to these people that I just worked with doing improv games and and fun and play. Um, And so it's something that people don't tend to connect this work with too often. Sure. Okay. So it's not just about comedy. It's not just about putting on a show. It sounds like there's a lot more to it. So let's dive in a little bit. Uh, So what are some of those fundamental tenets of improv that make it different from other ways of communicating, I guess, or I'm not sure what the right. Yeah. So it's, you're you're fine. You're fine. I try to make it really simple for people. Uh, And I say, don't make it anything other than what you would if you were talking about baseball or karate or yoga or You know, there's certain rules in every game or or practice uh, that, you know, you learn like, you know, three strikes are out or, you know, a a downward dog is done in, you know, in this way. And you learn rules of any anything that you're doing. And those rules and those tenets kind of help you play the game. Right. So in improv, it's the same thing. It's just that those rules and tenets are things like listening. Um, but intently, very, very, you know, passionately listening, as we like to say, or it's about agreement. There's a rule that, you know, you need to agree in order to, to create a story that can go anywhere. So there's this list of tenets, right? And yeah. sometimes practitioners like myself will say there's eight. Somebody else might say, well, I think there's 10. Okay. They're all very, very similar. So it's kind of like, I don't get caught up in that. I think there's the basic tenets of improvisation are really uh, heightened communication skills, listening, empathy, authenticity, uh, collaborating with others, accepting ideas. So there's this kind of loose set of tenets, but you have to really adhere to those, practice those, focus on those when you're playing the game in order to do it successfully, right? So we just take those same tenets into a different environment off the stage and say, how would we apply these to people taking care of Alzheimer's patients, for example? Or how would we apply these to leaders leading a team? Or how would we apply this to change managers to help implement change more seamlessly? So we're taking those same tenets. It's just that somewhere along the way, about 30 years ago, people uh, like me, even before me, said, wait a minute, this is not just kind of a set of tenets that can help you play the game of improv. This is kind of playing the game of life and work. And it's fun and it's different and it works. And then a whole crusade of us have followed. (laughs) (laughs) Well, let's take some of these and see how do you apply those at work? So maybe you could take maybe two or three of those and say, you know, how do we actually make this work at work? (laughs) Yeah. So I think since we're kind of change change focused here today, um, and I think it's very relevant in where we are in the business landscape today. So I think more than ever, Heather, you probably hear this or get it on a Google alert every day. Change is the only constant in business. <laughs> you know, we don't know any will change tomorrow. You know, change, change, change. We're hearing so much about it. And it's true. It is because of technology. It's because of the digital transformation. It's because of where we are today um, in the organizational landscape. It's moving yeah. faster than ever. So we get it, right? Um, and so I think it's a great, uh, a great thing for the people who do what I do or the work that I do, because uh, I'd say one of the biggest things improv can teach is to uh, really strengthen that adaptability muscle and that readiness for change. I think whether we realized it or not, when we started learning improv, those of us who started it as a hobby, like myself, I started to notice very quickly that change didn't bother me as much as it used to, because 
you can you can always guarantee if you step out onto a stage with someone to do improv comedy or improv theater, you can count on something changing every two seconds. <laughs> and so what you begin to do is develop this real skill to um, to accept it, take it for what it is and move on. And that's not comfortable sometimes. It's really not comfortable and it takes a it takes a lot of practice to kind of get used to that. So I think being adaptable to whatever comes your way, taking an uncomfortable thing and going, okay, I don't like this, but I'm going to have to live in it for a minute. Um, all of those things can, tra- you know, as well as I do, can transfer into work because that is the business landscape today. A lot of unexpected, a lot of pivot, a lot of curveballs. So what are we doing in traditional training, whether it's live training, virtual training, any other training that's really exercising that muscle the way that something like improv can. That's where I think the rubber really meets the road with this work and some of the big challenges in the organizational landscape today. Okay. Well, yeah, a lot of the resistance and discomfort that comes with change has to do with that uncertainty. You know, fundamentally, we crave that. We we want to know that tomorrow is going to look like today. Even though we can't guarantee it, though, we still want to feel that way. And so mm-hmm. it sounds like improv can help us with better handling the uncertainty that comes at us that happens to be change in a lot of cases. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, you know, I always tell people um, it's semi-hard to explain. Um, That's why I think our art form is kind of show, not tell. But I think, you know, the best way to put it to somebody who's never gone through the experience of an improv workshop or um, an experiential learning workshop, for that matter, where you're doing live simulations and interactions with each other. um, I tell people in workshops, you know, especially if I'm working with a team where we're shifting mindsets and culture a little bit, because, for example, I just worked with a team um, over a period of a couple of months uh, of a, on a series of workshops because they had grown so fast as an organization, their heads were spinning and they had forgotten to put certain things in process to ensure that their culture um, sort of remained, uh, you know, collaborative and open and, uh, you know, the communication skills had started to just sort of fly away. And so we went in there and I, I remember the big theme of this workshop was we're basically going to put you in a lot of scenarios and a lot of simulations where you're just going to be uncomfortable. (laughs) And the goal, and of course they look at me like, (laughs) great. (laughs) I really, really need to go. But I mean, I'm trying to be honest that, you know, the only way to really get used to change or the unexpected or curveballs or all this uncomfortable um, things that can happen is to just do it, just do it. And I know that sounds kind of like, okay, but um, the workshops are engaging and they're fun and everyone's vulnerable. So I think it's not like we just jump right in and say, okay, we're just, you know, let's, everybody's just going to get uncomfortable, you know? Yeah. We, we really ease our way into it and build from little moments to bigger moments. And we do it in a thoughtful way where we are priming everyone in the beginning and just really taking these steps. So by the end of a workshop, people are, people are sort of in a, in a place where they didn't even see it coming, if that makes sense. I tell people, I tell people I'm Miyagi them, you know, wax on, wax off. <laughs> and while I'm asking them to do these things, but I ask them to trust the process. And, and, you know, if we can go back to change real quick, you know, I, I, I work with a couple of change management professionals and they really, um, they really do more on the process side, the uh, uh, tactical side of things mm-hmm. and where we have been able to connect and work together, even if it's just brainstorming ideas for their work and my work is I put practice to the, the, the ideas and the things that I put sort of another layer to the work that they're doing because it allows for a live practice and a live skill building that can complement what they're trying to do today and change management, and change readiness. Because the truth is all that process and, and all the tactical stuff is great. But today it's, it's about, you know, when we're interacting with each other and what that culture 
you know, is really um, saying to anybody that's coming in new or, you know, uh, so shifting culture is hard, right? And change, uh, one of the things that we talk about is change today is not really about, we, we can, we already know it's a given that things are changing faster than they ever had. It's, it's, can we create cultures that are ready for that even before it happens? That's great. Yeah. You know what I mean, if it's just a given, then what are, how do we shift how we've looked at change management in a way that responds to where our climate is today? Okay. So what are some of the activities that you might do to get people more comfortable being uncomfortable with each other? Oh, it's all that way. <laughs> A couple of examples. I know, I know, I saw this question on your um, on your uh, email, and I was like, "Oh, that'll be good," because my mind goes to hundreds of exercises. Um, you know, I do. We do. We do one that's actually just about change, and this exercise is really cool, Heather, because you can do it a bunch of different ways. So I'm just going to share one with you. But you are um, you're getting people to pair up together and really just face each other for a little while and just really stare at each other with no talking. A lot of the exercises we do, believe it or not, takes the voice away. Mm -hmm. so we're, we're, you know, doing a lot of nonverbal because, you know, something like 97% of communication is nonverbal. It's astounding that people think it's all about the words. Yeah. So for the rest of this uh, podcast, we're just going to relive. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> So it, for those of you who are just listening, we're actually looking at each other too. So <laughs> yeah. they probably think those ladies have. We're just have, moving our mouths without actually talking. Yeah. Or we do a lot of gibberish exercises too. So it's either nonverbal gibberish where we're really just trying to say the words are not as important as we think they are. Sometimes it's your body. It's yeah. your eyes. So we do this exercise and we have these two people face each other and just really stare at each other for like an uninterrupted steady 20 seconds. So we just stare at each other and we make that establishment that it's nonverbal and you're just, that's kind of odd because we're not used to having that, you know, intimate interaction with people at work yeah, and right. stops and stares at you for 20 minutes because then you're either going to fight or kiss and we don't know which one. <laughs> yeah. Definitely call HR, right? <laughs> it's a little creepy. So in a workshop and people kind of don't like, what's happening? Why are we doing this? And I say, okay, so now that we have, have established that is uh, intimate, right? And we're not going to kiss and we're not going to fight each other. Let's give each other permission to, to look at each other. So they really just kind of look at each other and say, you have permission to look at me. And so like anything in business, we need a mission, right? We can't just like do it because we have to do it. We need a mission. And, and millennials love having purpose. So if I have millennials in my workshop, I can go on about that. But um, either way, you need a purpose. So your purpose is to study this person for another 20 seconds, except this time your mission is to take in as many details as you can about this person and just study it. And so they get another 20 seconds, then they get back to back and they're back to back. And I say, okay, so we're really going to make it our goal to take care of this person behind us that we're touching backs with right now. And the way that you're going to do that is take that information that you just studied and you're going to use it and it's going to benefit you. So I want you to, in the next 30 seconds, change three things about your appearance. And I kind of go, huh? You know, this is me arguing. I'm talking about what is she doing? I say, well, just think about this. If your job is to take care of this person behind you, then you want to change three things about yourself that are bold, not, you know, sort of, uh, uh, well, you want to be risky. You want to take a risk. You want to make a bold choice. So you, you could roll up a sleeve or you could roll up a pant leg, but you could also put a shoe on your head, <laughs> right? Because if you just roll a sleeve up and unbutton a button and maybe put, put some hair behind your ear, chances are your partner might not notice that because it's not very bold, even though they studied you. So we go through that a little bit. I give them 30 seconds and most of the time it clicks with people and you'll see a shoe come off and be put in someone's pocket. I had a, a very high VP level person at a very large Atlanta-based company. Uh, he unbuttoned his shirt and didn't have an undershirt on underneath. So we really got the, the full effects there. But I think the leader, he was trying to say, 
Nobody in this room is going to top me because I'm going to take risks with all of you, right? No one's going to look bad because I'm going to look the worst. (laughs) I think that was his thinking, right? I hope so. (laughs) After 30 seconds, you turn around and you can look around the room, although I tell them to take the first 10 seconds to guess what each other changed. Mm -hmm. There's several things that come out of this exercise. If I'm really working with a team just to get them more vulnerable and, and, and taking risk, I, I concentrate on the fact that those bold choices are so important if we're going to take care of each other in a work environment. Because you want to show that if they're going to put their neck out, so are you. But then if you want to really focus on change, you talk about you had 20 seconds to study each other's appearance. When they turned around, were you able to guess? And if not, why? Why do we, uh, how, how much are we really taking in um, of someone when they're standing right in front of us? And we talk a little bit then about the change, uh, the, the idea of change and how it's uncomfortable and hard. And when you went to turn around, you, it's a risk to put your shoe in your pocket or your, you know, your, your uh, shirt over your head or whatever it is that, you know, you decided to do. But that is the essence of change. It's risky. It's uncomfortable. You might make a fool of yourself. What if somebody doesn't support you? So we really emphasize with that exercise so many different levels of change, big and small. It really depends on where I want to take that group. But, you know, at the heart of it is change is hard. It's a big risk sometimes, but and you have to get uncomfortable. But if we're all taking care of each other and supporting each other's uh, risk, um, it's a lot easier, right? So that's just one very long-winded explanation to a live uh, exercise that by the end, I feel like everyone has had sort of an aha moment in, in like I said, a bigger, small way about change. Great, great example. Thank you. Much better done live, I promise. Oh, I'm sure <laughs> than just describing it. <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> earlier you mentioned that uh, one of the tenets is about agreement. And so I was curious about that because a lot of times we need, if we're trying to influence change ourselves, we need to gain agreement from a lot of people that, yes, this is the direction we want to go. And these are the steps we're going to take. This is what everybody's piece is. Yeah. So I'm curious, what do you do for that? Oh, that's a good one. That is a good and lengthy one. I think I feel like I could do a week on just agreement, but we really start at the basic sort of you know, the, the fundamental that a lot of people have heard of, it's become a little, little bit of a bumper sticker, which is the yes and rule. Because in improv, that rule has sort of made its way into corporate America uh, for brainstorming and, and you know, companies that, uh, that uh, you know, are being innovative and trying to generate ideas a lot. Um, so the yes and is the if fundamental rule of improv because, um, and I think we mentioned this earlier, if, if you're creating something in a moment with someone, the last thing you want to do is shut them down. Yeah. The last thing you want to do is, even if it's a crazy idea, like, you know, Heather, let's go, um, you know, let's go, uh, you know, walk uh, in the middle of, of the street in downtown Atlanta um, at 5 p.m. during rush hour traffic. You know, that's a horrible idea. <laughs> Rob, we say, yeah. because it's the game. We're going back to those rules. Remember, there's just the rules and you don't question them. You just do them, Right. And one of the rules is you say yes and. So, you know, you might say yes, and I will probably bring a, um, a megaphone so I can alert everybody when we're coming because I don't want to get hit. <laughs> you know, there's a, there's a different answer than no, or that's a horrible idea, Christy, or so the yes, idea, but. yeah, or yeah, but, which is our favorite. It's like a, it's like a dressed up no, you know, I mean. But I still know, but I put on a little tuxedo. (laughs) That's what we like to say. So I think the idea with that and people get carried away, you're not going to say yes to crazy ideas. And eventually, over time, you may end up saying no to an idea that originated. But the idea is to uh, just see what happens if you let it breathe for a little while and and, and agree with it for just a little while. Uh, If the stakes are low and you're in a brainstorming session and it's just about generating ideas, there's no harm there. Yep. And the same with improv comedy. I think we just decided this rule works because every time we get on stage with Bobby and he says no to everything, we're standing on stage like some dorks and the audience is looking at us like, that. what are they, this, they're arguing. This is not working. They're, this is no fun. It's so, not funny. Yes. You know, we built this crazy 
crazy idea. So to your point earlier in my workshops, there's a lot of different versions of a brainstorming session that we do. And I have the, the participants get into groups in like five, anywhere from five to 10. And we tell them to brainstorm a bunch of ideas. And we tell them that, um, that one of the rules is that they can't say no to anything. So we tell them they have to invent a product or they have to invent an iPhone app or we give them something to invent and they have to say yes to everything that gets brought up in their little group. So they're like, oh, well, this is going to be disastrous. But what they do come up with at the end is, is something that even surprises them. Like, oh, if we said no to that, we wouldn't have gotten here. What they learn is we started with a peanut and, and now we're in Vegas um, and, and, you know, whatever they were planning or if it was a party or an event, you know, we started out, you know, in Conyers and we ended up in Vegas or we started out with this and we ended up here and they get this sort of tiny little, what I call a nearling when it's not quite there. If you don't know what that is, Google it sometime for fun. I didn't even know it was a word and I found it doing research one day, but a company had, had coined uh, what a fresh idea uh, was called in a, they coined it a, a nearling. And I love that because it's almost there, but not quite. But eventually if you keep yes anding, that nearling will become something pretty smart, but sorry. So, so yes, my peanut and Conyers ideas were kind of crazy. I just pulled those out of my hat. But the idea is you come up with a, a small, tiny nugget of an idea that can grow into something. Okay. So it sounds like if we wanted to adopt this as a tenant, at least briefly in a meeting, we could just make a suggestion like, let's, for the next 10 minutes, we can't say no to anything. Right. right. Approach it this way. And I would even add another layer to that. Like, you know, anything that gets brought up, let's really, let's take it in and see if we can add something to it. Whatever gets mentioned, let's just go ahead and say yes and, or, you know, let's say what I like about that is, or, you know, we, we have two or three different things we do in workshops to give people alternatives because you've always got the skepticals in your workshop. They're like, well, you can't, I mean, that's just crazy. You can't, you know, the business mind has a hard time wrapping its head around yes and because especially if you're left-brained and yeah. you're like, you know, analytical minded and, and they're, you can't say yes if somebody wants to do this or that. And I'm like, you're right, you can't, but let's just, Play this exercise where no matter what they say, maybe you don't say yes, but you have to either say thank you and add something to it, or you have to say what I like about that idea and add something mm -hmm. to it. The thing is, Heather, when you get people in those workshops just to start thinking about alternative ways to behave and they can feel what that experience is like in a low stakes environment with someone else, another human, they do start to slowly come around and thinking, oh, yeah, I didn't realize how much I was saying no and shutting things down. It doesn't mean they're going to walk out of that workshop and say yes to everything. But they are certainly aware of other alternatives yeah. or, you know, being open. Great. Well, I feel like we could talk about this all afternoon. I know. <laughs> But thanks so much for sharing these ideas for, and these stories, these examples. I appreciate yeah. that. Where, If people want to dive in and uh, maybe do a workshop or just learn more, where can they find you? So um, my website, Brave Space Biz, B-I-Z, all one word, of course, because it's a website, um, has a lot of resources. And one of them that people find very cool is a free workshop I do every quarter. And it is for anybody in business just wanting to dip their toe in the water. It can be a training person who might consider bringing this methodology into their company or just a professional who's thinking about sharpening their own skill set. Um, and I give this workshop every quarter. It's a uh, two-hour free uh, improv for business workshop. And it really just sort of covers a bunch of really fun ways that this work can be applied to any job in business. and then. Um, I do uh, improv uh, for professionals. It's called BizProf. It's a six-week series. I try to do it twice a year. Um, I used to do it three, but now I kind of wait until I have enough of a, of a waiting list of sure. a house of students. And I just finished one in Sandy Springs at the Sandy Springs Innovation Center. We had nine students who went through a six-week BizProf uh, class. And every week we covered a different tenant. So adaptability 
one week. Executive presence was another week. And they have such a good time and they come in there not knowing each other from a bar of soap. And you've got a copywriter in there. You've got a retired leader in there. You've got a pharmacist in there. You've got an executive admin in there. And by the time they finish that six weeks together, it's like they formed a rock band. (laughs) Solid and in tune and in sync together. And and it's just a beautiful uh, experience for me to watch because it really, well, it always reaffirms why I do this work. Because it's so transformative. And it's so, it's a personal journey, a personal development journey. Um, So those are the ways biz, um, sorry, uh, bravespacebiz.com. And feel free to link up with me on LinkedIn too, because I share a lot of uh, fun things on LinkedIn. One in particular that's out there now, Heather, if you haven't seen it, I am eating a taco. Yes, I did see that. (laughs) And a lot of people didn't get that. And I thought, well, wait a minute. Have they not seen Tina Fey's video? on SNL where she eats the cake really, really fast. And she's talking, I think, about an election. The thing is, I I forgot about what she was talking about because the fact that she could cram so much cake in her mouth. that And it's Tina Fey, who I think is just a graceful and, and very talented, smart lady. So I put this video up and there were only about two people out of 17,000 views probably that I think the video is up to now that came back and said, why would you put that out there? Why wouldn't I? That's not how you're supposed to act. It's irony. It's sarcasm. I'm an actor. <laughs> My mom did teach me manners, <laughs> but this is <laughs> it's funny. Yeah. So anyway, um, I, I've had a blast. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thanks for being here. Of course. And thank you for listening to the change, to the Influence Change at Work show. Uh, if you'd like to find more resources to help you influence change in your organization, including individual coaching, team workshops, and upcoming training events, please visit eclaria.com. And while you're there, be sure to download the free change readiness assessment to find out if your change initiative is set up for success. Until next time, best wishes on your change initiative.